ladies and gentlemen, if you'll get settled into your seats, please, we're going to go ahead and get started with our third and final panel for the afternoon. Now, in similar format as the panel you saw earlier this morning in opening statements, I thought it appropriate to close our conference for the day with closing arguments. Uh, we have three exceptional panelists here for you today in a similar way. We will have Judge Michael Leaf from Ventura County sitting for our bench. Judge Leaf, who graduated from the law school in 1995, was elected to the position of judge for Ventura County Superior Court in 2014. Before joining the bench, Leaf was a senior deputy attorney with the Ventura County District Attorney's Office, where in addition to prosecuting criminal cases, he worked to stem recidivism in the defendant population by helping offenders receive mental health services. He previously served as an attorney with the Marvel Animation, and Judge Leaf is the co-author of Ladies and Gentlemen of the Jury, Greatest Closing Arguments in Modern Law, and The Devil's Advocates, Greatest Closing Arguments in Criminal Modern Law. He's also a Navy veteran, having been honorably discharged from the service in 1985. In addition to his law school from the Caruso School of Law, Judge Leaf earned his bachelor's from Drew University. Please join me in welcoming Judge Michael Leaf. For our attorney positions, first I'd like to introduce Molly McKibben, a graduate of the school from 2010. Molly is a partner at Green Belay Wheeler in Santa Monica, California. Uh, Molly's practice, trial practice focuses on ca catastrophic personal injury, wrongful death, and products liability. In 2016, she was chosen as the Consumer Attorneys of California, cons uh, California's Consumer Attorney of the Year. Molly is a member of the CAOC board and is also a member of the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles, the American Association for Justice, and the Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles. Her work has been published by the Daily Journal and The Advocate, and she mentors law students through the Caruso School of Law Preceptor Program. She served as an editor of the Pepperdine Law Review while in law school and earned her bachelor's in print journalism in Italian from the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Molly McKibben. And finally, please join me in welcoming Olivier Talieu, Olivier is the chief trial attorney of the Dominguez firm and handles complex and hard fought cases. Mr. Talio has been recognized by his peers as an outstanding advocate for his clients. He was one of five finalists for the prestigious Cal trial, uh, trial Lawyer of the Year Award in 2017, nominated again in 2018, and was one of the five finalists again in 2019. Advocate Mag Magazine has featured multiple articles authored by him on traumatic brain injuries and various trial skills. Mr. Talio serves on the Cal Board of Governors and on the Board of Consu uh, the CAOC. He was also nominated for Leaders in Law Award by the Los Angeles Business Journal, and he's been selected six times to the Southern California Super Lawyers List, named as one of the 10 best in client satisfaction for the past three years running, and was acclaimed Lawyer of Distinction from 2016 to 2019. Olivier Talio graduated summa cum laude from Arizona State University and graduated first in his class from George Washington University School of Law. Please join me in introducing all of you. And with that, I'll pass it to Judge Leaf to provide his insights on closing arguments. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's nice to return to Pepperdine. I spent three wonderful years here learning how to think like a lawyer, and then the past 25 years actually putting much of what I learned here into practice, including everything I learned from Professor Caldwell and Professor Perrin in trial practice. I was just telling Mark Hippler uh, during the lunch break that because of the training I received at Pepperdine in trial practice, that when I entered the DA's office in 1996, I came in off cycle, and by reputation, they had been told that I was trial ready, even though I hadn't finished law school all that long ago. And on my first day in the office, they handed me a file and said, uh, you're supposed to be picking a jury in courtroom 27 in about 10 minutes. And I was off to the races, and it's been great ever since. Trial practice is the best. 
getting up in front of a jury is the best. And the best part of being in front of a jury is when the trial is done and you're ready to give your closing argument. You've probably heard different things throughout your careers about the best way to prepare for trial. And some people talk about writing your closing argument before you do anything else. I was never a big fan of that. What I tried to do was to simply know my case. Because if you know your case, you can talk about your case. And the people that I saw who did the best in a courtroom, whether it was as a judge watching the advocates or whether I was an advocate watching my opponent, the people who seemed to do the best were the ones who were comfortable in the courtroom. You know, public speaking is the biggest fear that people have. It's worse than heights. It's even worse than spiders. But the key is to stand up in front of a jury of 12 and begin making your case, arguing on behalf of your client. It all begins with knowing your case. And once you do that, everything falls into place. Jean Giraudoux, the French novelist and playwright, said that the key to success is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. It's also been attributed to George Burns, but I think it always sounds classier when you can attribute it to a French playwright. And that goes for your case as well. Believe in your case. Know your case. Because ultimately, you're going to be talking to the jury about it. One of the things that Professor Caldwell has been lecturing for more than 25 years is to engage in a horizontal dialogue with the jury. Don't talk down to them. That seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how many attorneys don't put that into practice. I was presiding over a trial about two years ago. Let me ask you this. Quick show of hands, how many of you think it's a good idea in a jury trial to insult the intelligence of the jury? Shockingly, I don't see any hands. I watched an attorney stand up in closing argument and use a word, I can't remember what it was, and he paused and he said, I'm probably the only one in this courtroom with the education to even know what that word means. But let me explain it to you. And I watched the faces of the jury, which he probably should have been doing because he lost them at that moment. Don't talk down to the jury. You establish your rapport with them during jury selection and you pay attention to them. One of the key things that I've developed during my career as a lawyer and one that I've looked for with the advocates in front of me, and I do have the ability with young attorneys to talk to them if they're interested once the trial is done and the appellate period is run, is to just give them some tips, some observations about what they've done, what they've done well, and what they could improve on. Part of it is listening. Listening to what's going on in the courtroom. Listen to the witnesses. Don't get tied down to a script. Don't get tied down to your questions. Pay attention to the responses you get and then incorporate them into your argument. Nowadays, people are using PowerPoint. When I started out, people were still using flip charts. As a judge, I find it endearing when I see somebody bringing flip charts into a courtroom. But the advantage that PowerPoint has is the ability with your laptop to, laptop to quickly, on the fly, make adjustments to your closing argument. Incorporate things that have happened in trial. Remember when you're cross-examining a witness, that you're not looking for the Perry Mason moment in trial. You're looking to elicit facts that you can incorporate into your closing argument. And sometimes just play it off. And then what you can do is you can insert it into your argument and you can bring the jury in. You can say, do you remember? Do you remember when I had the plaintiff on the stand and I asked him this question? And do you remember what he said? you get it down. And the jury is, they should be checking their notes. Hopefully you've got the quote right. Then you can put it up on the PowerPoint and read along with them. This is what the witness said, and this is why it's important. Remember that everything during the trial is geared towards proving the elements of your case and being able to put it up there so they can read it and say, huh, that's exactly right. I remember that moment. You're collecting key moments to use in your closing argument. Sometimes finding a pithy way to say it helps. The OJ trial, how many of you remember that? Most of us. Johnny Cochran said, if 
it doesn't fit, you must acquit, the bloody glove. It sounded kind of cheesy, but it worked, and it was something that was memorable. Years ago, I worked on a book with Professor Caldwell, and one of the arguments we included was Jerry Spence's argument from the Karen Silkwood case. Karen Silkwood was somebody who worked for a nuclear power plant. She ultimately tried to bring out some allegations that Kerr McGee, which operated the power plant, was involved in contamination of employees, and she was killed. Big lawsuit. Her family sued. And Jerry Spence, who is a folksy homespun lawyer, was great at engaging in a horizontal dialogue with the jury. He found a way to explain the concept of strict liability to them in a way that was unforgettable. And he hearkened back to English law, and he talked about strict liability and how it started with the idea that a man had kept a lion on his property, and it was a dangerous beast. And he was responsible for that lion. And through no fault of his own, that lion had escaped, and it had hurt someone. And at trial, the explanation was the man said, I did nothing wrong. I had high walls. I had strong locks. I did nothing. And yet that lion managed to escape and hurt someone. And Jerry Spence explained to the jury that plutonium is the lion. It's so inherently dangerous that Kerr McGee had an absolute obligation to keep that dangerous beast contained. And maybe even through no fault of their own, the plutonium got out, the lion escaped, and someone got hurt. And Jerry Spence explained to the jury that if the lion got away, Kerr McGee has to pay. That preceded uh, the OJ trial by almost 20 years, but it was a memorable way of explaining strict liability in an unforgettable way. Something that I've seen on the bench, regrettably, is people misusing PowerPoint. How many of you, I hope you haven't done it, but how many of you in trial have looked at ye, the other side's PowerPoint slide and it's got about 5,000 words in eight point type? It's impossible to read. I think the best way to think about a PowerPoint slide is it's kind of like the outline that you're gonna work off of to give your closing argument. You don't have to be tied to your legal pad. If you've used PowerPoint slides to make big points that you can then talk about or to include important quotes That'll work. Think about each slide being a discrete thought that's easy to read. If it can't be looked at and grasped in a matter of moments, you've got too much information on the slide. Break it up into two or three slides. Edit it down. Be able to talk about your case. The other thing that I got as a piece of advice at the beginning of my career that I've been able to incorporate into my time as a prosecutor and as a judge. I got it from Professor Chase's husband, who is now a federal judge. At the time, he was a high-powered lawyer. And what he told us was, as young law students, his goal for his entire legal career when he walked into a courtroom, whether he was in front of a judge or in front of a jury, was to be the voice of reason. He always wanted people to hear what he had to say and to think, well, that was reasonable. I mean, I may not agree with it on the merits, but that was a reasonable thing to say, a reasonable position to take. I have seen lawyers get up in court and compare their clients to Jesus Christ. I am not exaggerating. That same lawyer went on to compare his client to Mohandas Gandhi. And he compared his client to Mother Teresa. It didn't help that it was a robbery, but he lost the jury. He lost credibility. And so the same piece of advice that I got from that lawyer and the same piece of advice I got from Justice Armand Arabian sitting in this room 25 years ago about your reputation being important, something that you spend a career making and losing in an instant applies to your closing arguments as well. Hopefully, you've established credibility throughout the trial, starting from the very beginning in voir dire, when you asked reasonable questions and listened to the responses of every prospective juror. I will also tell you I've had the experience of being a juror on a six-week-long civil case, and that was a fascinating experience as well. The jurors pay attention to everything you do throughout the entire trial, 
even when you're not talking, when you're sitting at council table, they're watching the way you react to what's going on at the other side. If they believe that you believe in your case, if they believe everything you've said is reasonable, if everything you've said during trial has proven to at least be reasonable and supported by the evidence, you've got their trust. And you'll keep their trust throughout the trial. Again, I think the final thing that you want to think about during closing argument is, are you connecting with them? Watch them. Pay attention and listen to the other side. If you're the plaintiff and you have an opportunity to give a rebuttal, try and incorporate something you've heard from the other side's closing argument. Don't just rebut everything. Pick two or three things that you need to rebut, but make sure that you incorporate something that they've said into your rebuttal. Be reasonable, be responsive. And remember, if you believe in your case, if you know your case, if you're able to synthesize the facts that have come out in the trial into your theory and put that into your argument, you will likely have great success. I guess the final thing to remember is it's not all you. As brilliant as you may be, you're still stuck with the facts and the evidence that come out of trial. And sometimes you may have given the most brilliant closing argument of your career, but the facts still kind of sucked. And you didn't get it. But you still gave your best. And you still gave a compelling closing argument. And that's really all you can do for your client is do your best. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Molly. Thank you for your attention. This is a case about a company that put profits over safety, a company that prioritized dollars and cents over common sense safety precautions. The evidence that you've heard and seen throughout this trial leads to one logical conclusion, that Urban Commons LLC put its bottom line ahead of the safety of the guests that stayed at its hotel. And what has the undisputed evidence in this case showed you? That in 2012, Urban Commons purchased the Embassy Suites Anaheim North Hotel and thereafter specifically marketed this hotel to families with small children, advertising the fact that it was affiliated with the Disneyland Resort. It is undisputed that Urban Commons then hired third-party consultants to come in and inspect the hotel and tell them how they could make it safer. It is undisputed that every single consultant that looked at this hotel found the same dangerous condition. The center atrium of this building that had six floors of guest rooms, each floor lined with a metal railing, and that all of the bars on these railings were too far apart, so far apart that a small child could fit through. And that it is undisputed that each of these consultants told Urban Commons that these railings were too far apart, that they violated the California Building Code, and that they needed to be fixed. And it is undisputed that Urban Commons did nothing until a little girl died. And why is it that Urban Commons chose to ignore all of the warnings, warnings that they paid for? because it costs money to make things safe. Because Urban Commons wanted to spend money on things that were more exciting, like making its lobby a little fancier, or putting in a modern restaurant, or getting rid of the dated koi pond that was in the atrium. Urban Commons cut conscious decision to prioritize the aesthetic renovations of its hotel, its profits over the safety of its guests, costs a three-year-old girl her life. And you, the jury, the members of the community that have been chosen to render a verdict in this case, have the opportunity to provide justice to two grieving parents who lost their youngest daughter to corporate greed. On July 18th, 2015, the Martinez family were guests at the Embassy Suites Anaheim North Hotel. Mom Alejandra picked this hotel because it was associated with Disneyland. 
She knew she could buy tickets to the park at the front desk of the hotel, and they could take the free shuttle back and forth to the park. Dad, Jesus, was excited about the indoor pool that he could take his daughters to swim in, and the free happy hour they offered at 5 p.m. where the kids could get free Shirley Temples and popcorn. So on that day, the day that this photograph was taken, they took their two little girls, seven-year-old Melanie and three-year-old Stephanie to Disneyland. And they spent the day as millions of other families have, seeing who could get the highest score on the Buzz Lightyear ride, eating 15 churros. And for reasons unbeknownst to me, in July, it started to rain in the afternoon. And so the whole family got soaked because they weren't prepared for rain. So Jesus and Alejandra decided to take the girls back to the hotel so they could change their clothes, eat some dinner, and go back to the park for fireworks. So they got back to the hotel and they went up to their fifth floor room. And Jesus and Melanie changed really quick, and then they took the elevator back down to the lobby where the restaurant was to wait in line to order some food to bring up for Alejandra and Stephanie. And while they were gone, Alejandra changed Stephanie into some dry clothes. She even put on the Minnie Mouse sandals that they bought at the park for her. And then she decided to put on some cartoons in the living room area for Stephanie to watch while she took a few seconds to go to the bathroom. And in those few seconds, three-year-old Stephanie, who had never once wandered off, never once even gotten lost at a Target, decided she was going to leave the room to look for her dad. She opened the door, she went down to her right, and she started walking down the hall, looking in the atrium area below for her father. And she saw her dad and her sister standing there. And so she pushed her head between the bars and these railings. And she started yelling, Papa, Melanie, look at me. But they couldn't hear her. They were five stories below her. Meanwhile, Alejandra comes out of the bathroom and her daughter is gone. And she frantically starts looking throughout the two bedroom suite. When she realizes she's not in the room, she runs outside. She looks to her left, she doesn't see anything. She looks to her right, and her daughter is leaning between the bars, with her hands behind her, yelling for her father. And she yells, Stephanie, and starts running towards her. But before she gets there, her daughter loses her grip. She falls five stories, hitting the second floor railing, and then landing on the tile floor of the atrium just a few feet from where her father was standing. And even though EMTs got there as fast as they could, and this little girl was gasping for air, it was too late. She sustained blunt force trauma to her body, and she was pronounced dead less than 10 minutes after arriving at UC Irvine Hospital. These parents cannot comprehend this loss. They do not understand why their daughter is not here. And it was only after filing this lawsuit that they learned how truly preventable her death was. Urban Commons had every opportunity to prevent this little girl from dying. It was given multiple warnings and it ignored every single one and made excuses for its ignorance. In June 2012, right after Urban Commons bought this hotel, three years before Stephanie died, they paid for an architect to come out and inspect the hotel and let them know what needed to be fixed. And you heard from Mr. Harvey, that architect. He told you that when he was walking around doing his inspection, he didn't even have to measure these bars because he could tell just from looking at them that they were too wide, that they violated the California Building Code section that had to do with railings, and they needed to be fixed. So he wrote that in his report. And he gave that report to Taylor Woods. You heard from Mr. Woods, the president of Urban Commons. And did Mr. Woods incorporate those changes? Did he make sure that these railings were safe for the children that he wanted to stay at his hotel? We know he didn't, or this little girl would still be here. So what was his excuse for not fixing these railings in 2012? He told you. He never read Mr. Harvey's report. He never read the section requiring them to change the railings. He never even told anyone at his company that this report recommended the railings be changed. 
He told you he took this report, he put it on a folder in his computer, and he never told anyone about it. Is that what a reasonable hotel owner would do? Mr. Woods got another warning. In 2013, the hotel was being renovated. And you heard from Mr. Donato, who was the project manager in charge of the renovations at that time. This was two years before Stephanie was killed. Mr. Donato paid to have a company come out and do an ADA evaluation, which tells that, would tell Urban Commons what they needed to do to make the hotel safe for people who are disabled and just for regular guests. And Mr. Donato told you that every single thing in this ADA report, every thing that they said needed to be fixed was required. It had to be addressed. It was not optional for Urban Commons to pick and choose. And the same person, or the person that did this uh, evaluation found the same dangerous condition that Mr. Harvey had. They found that these railings were too far apart, that they violated the California Building Code, and that they needed to be either modified or replaced to make them safe for the children that would be staying at this hotel. So did they listen? Did they fix these railings? We know they didn't or Stephanie Martinez would still be here. So what was their excuse for not listening to this report? Well, there's something in the water at Urban Commons. Perhaps they all have a disease that makes them incapable of reading reports that are emailed to them. Because Mr. Donato got up here and he told you. He just skimmed this report. He said he doesn't even remember reading the section that has to do with the railings. Is that what a reasonable hotel owner and operator would do? Urban Commons got a third opportunity to fix these railings. In 2015, early 2015, Brett Morrison, you remember, you heard from him. He was the general contractor who was in charge of the renovations at that time. And Mr. Morrison told you that he wasn't even working on any of the guest floor areas, but he was walking past the railings one day and he could tell, just like Mr. Harvey, without even measuring them, that the railings were too far apart. So he immediately went and told people at Urban Commons. You remember Ms. Paulsgrove, the project manager from Urban Commons, confer confirmed to you that Mr. Morrison had told her that the railings were too wide, that they violated the building code, and that they needed to be changed. And he also told T Tanya Eisenman, who confirmed to you when she was testifying, that he had told her they needed to be changed. And Ms. Paulsgrove even said she emailed Mr. Woods and said, hey, these aren't to code. We got to change them. So did they do it? If they had, this little girl would still be here. These parents would still have their daughter. So what was their excuse for not following Mr. Morrison's recommendation? The defense will get up here and tell you that as soon as they found out from Mr. Morrison that these railings needed to be changed, that they put it on the timeline in the renovation as soon as possible. There wasn't any sooner they could have done it given the state of the renovations. I don't buy it. This company knew in 2012 that these railings were dangerous, and they did nothing. They could have fixed them three years before she died. What was their next excuse? Well, there's nothing we could have done until we could permanently fix the railings. So we put it on the schedule, set up to go, and until that happens, just is what it is. You know that's not true. Because you saw this. Two weeks after this little girl was killed, this hotel put up plastic safety fencing on all six floors of their guest room. It cost $880 to a company that paid $25 million for this hotel. They couldn't be bothered to do that in 2012 when they got the first report, or 2013 when they got the second report, or even in March of 2015, just a few months before she died, when there was already construction going on at the hotel, and having plastic fencing wouldn't have been abnormal. But they made the choice to do nothing. Now the defense will get up and tell you, there's no way that they would have been able to put up this fencing before she died. That this ho hotel, as you've heard, is a franchised Hilton property, and that Hilton had to approve anything they did and that there's no way Hilton would have allowed such an eyesore to exist for months on end. Well, first of all, they never asked. They never asked Hilton if they could put up some fencing 
And I bet you if they had gone to Hilton and said, hey, we have this dangerous thing on our property that could kill someone, can we do something to fix it? Hilton probably would have said yes. But even if Hilton had said no, there were other options. They could have installed plexiglass. Would have cost $1,600. Wouldn't have been an eyesore and would have made sure that no child got hurt or killed. But they chose to do nothing. And when I say they did nothing, I mean truly nothing. They couldn't have even been bothered to print out some small signs on their inkjet printer behind their front desk that says, caution, these railings are dangerous. Or give verbal warnings to the parents that are checking in with little kids. Hey, we're in the middle of a renovation. Watch your kids, make sure you keep them away from the railings. Their indifference to the lives of the people that they were making money off of is not reasonable. It is appalling. The evidence is overwhelming in this case that Urban Commons is liable for Stephanie Martinez's death. And what I mean when I say that is that they're negligent. And you have heard the judge give you the law and tell you that we have to prove that they were negligent. And the law tells you that Urban Commons is negligent if it fails to use reasonable care to keep its hotel in a reasonably safe condition. Do any one of you think that this hotel was in a reasonably safe condition on July 18th, 2015? I don't, or she would still be here. The law also tells you that Urban Commons must use reasonable care to discover any unsafe conditions at its hotel. This is not optional. Urban Commons is not allowed to stick its head in the sand and say, we didn't know something was dangerous. The law requires them to take affirmative efforts to find dangerous things on their property. And then the law requires them to do something about it. They are required to repair, replace, guard against, or warn about anything they know is dangerous. That is not something I am telling you. That is what the law tells you. And this company made the choice to do nothing. That is negligence. So when you go back, to the jury deliberation room, and you look at the first question on that verdict form, and it asks you, was Urban Commons negligent in the maintenance or use of its property? That is an easy yes. And the next question that you'll have to answer is whether their negligence was a, was a substantial factor in causing this three-year-old girl's death. That is also an easy answer, because you only have to look at one piece of evidence. You recall. The Anaheim Police Department took a bunch of measurements in this case, including measurements of three-year-old Stephanie's body after she was pronounced dead. And they took a measurement of her head. It was five inches. If these bars had been four inches, as the code requires, she couldn't have gotten through. She'd still be here. She'd probably be in timeout for running out of her hotel room, but she'd be alive. So when you get to the question that asks you whether their negligence was a substantial factor in causing her death, that's an easy yes. So I have one final thing I want to discuss with you before I get to damages. And that's the argument I know that the defense is going to get up and make when it's their turn to talk to you. You've heard their opening statement. You've heard the questions they've asked of witnesses. You know that they're going to ask you to apportion all or the majority of the fault for this little girl's death to her mother, Alejandra Sandoval. And let's be clear, the burden of proof is with them to prove that Alejandra Sandoval acted unreasonably, that she failed to use reasonable care. That is their burden. And I think if you look at the totality of the circumstances and the evidence in this case, it is abundantly clear that she acted as any reasonable parent would. Any reasonable parent would check into a hotel your home away from home, a place you know is courting families with children and think that it's safe. A reasonable parent would probably not lock the door behind their husband when they went downstairs to get food, knowing they were gonna come right back up with dinner. And a reasonable parent would believe that they could leave their little girl who had never once run off before in front of some cartoons in the living room while they went to the bathroom for a few minutes after a long day at Disneyland. I don't think they can meet their burden to prove that Alejandra Sandoval was negligent. So when you get to the questions on the verdict form that ask you whether she was negligent and whether she deserves any fault, 
Easy now. So this case is about the value of safety. It's about the value of prioritizing safety over money. Urban Commons, through its conscious decision to repeatedly choose money over safety, has created a debt. And justice requires that that debt be paid. If what Urban Commons choices had done had destroyed a car, it'd be very easy for us to decide how we repay that debt. We'd go to the Kelly Blue Book website, we'd put in the year and model of the car, and it would tell us the value of the vehicle. And we'd tell Urban Commons, okay, you have to pay that amount to the owner of the car that you destroyed. But in this case, Urban Commons choices did not destroy a car. It destroyed these parents' lives. And that is a debt that has to be repaid. We don't live in an eye for an eye society. Alejandra and Jesus do not wish that they could take one of Mr. Wood's children and sacrifice them for the death of their daughter. We live in a country that has decided that an award of money damages, damages compensates for the loss of life. And it is your job to appraise the value of that life. And you get to answer the question, what are Jesus and Alejandra's damages? for the loss of their daughter. And let's be clear, we are only seeking non-economic damages in this case. So there's no fixed standard you can use to decide what that amount is. But the law says that if we've proved our case, then you must decide how much money will reasonably compensate these parents for the death of their daughter. That is not optional. You must use your common sense and your judgment to decide what is reasonable. I suggest that you look at the loss of the life that will never be. The loss to Alejandra of never again hearing the best four words in the English language. I love you, mommy. Or the loss to Jesus of never being able to teach his daughter his favorite sport. The loss to both of them, of the day of pride when they get to watch her walk across the stage at graduation for high school, so excited that she's gotten into college and thrilled for the adventure that lies before her the loss of the next 15 years without her at home. You get to appraise that. And in considering what that loss is, don't forget the specific items of damage that the judge told you that you're to consider and award money for. For the loss of Stephanie's love, of her affection. You recall her parents, her aunts and uncles telling you what an affectionate little girl she was, how she loved to hug and kiss. They will never feel her hug again. You're to compensate them for the loss of her assistance, her comfort, her care, her protection. And you may ask yourself, how can a three-year-old protect their adult parents? But you are to compensate for the loss of her life, not just as a three-year-old, but as a 40-year-old taking care of her parents who are old and need help going to doctor's appointments or filling prescriptions. They don't, won't have her there to help them. You're to compensate them for the loss of her companionship, her society, her moral support. When this family goes through hard times, when there's financial ruin, when there's difficulties, they won't have Stephanie to call and provide sunny optimism or advice. She won't be there. What is the value of this child's life in this community? That determination is your role in the justice system. But I ask you, is there anything more precious in our society than the lives of our children? Ladies and gentlemen, I have had the privilege of carrying the mantle of responsibility for this case and for this family for the last two years. And today, I take that mantle from my shoulders and put it into your trusting hands. And all that I ask is that when you go home at the end of this trial and you go back to your family and they ask you, what did you do in court? You can look them in the eye and say, I made my country a safer place. I told two parents that their daughter's life had value and I provided full and complete justice. Thank you very much.
couple of quick observations. First off, nicely done. I note that there were some good use of the verdict forms. It's always good to show the jury what it is you want them to do. You tell them what you want them to do, but it's helpful to actually show them where to put the X, where to write the dollar amount. It's helpful. There was also a good horizontal dialogue. I never got the sense at all Molly was talking down to you, and this would be a particularly bad jury to talk down to. Uh, parenthetically, wow. I sat in on a case so. years ago, which was workers' comp, and the person being accused of having committed fraud had suffered a terrible injury, allegedly, that prevented him from working, and yet was seen dancing at a party. What the lawyer kept talking about to the jury was that this person had suffered a bilateral comminuted calcaneal fracture. And I said to him on a break, man, why don't you just tell him that his heels were shattered? Because it just was so drawn out and it had no punch to it. Say it once to establish the medical term and then say, what we're really talking about is the guy's heels were supposedly shattered into 150 pieces, but he was boogieing down at a party. Is that reasonable? So the use of the medical term, while technically accurate, just didn't connect with the jury, didn't make the point. A good discussion of non-economic damages and including the, the theme repeated of loss, 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 and the loss of the four best words that anyone would hear, which is, of course, I love you, mommy. Thought that was very nicely done. Something to think about from the nuts and bolts of the bench before we launch into Olivier, something that uh, I see quite often and something for you to keep in mind. Judge Manny Real in the federal bench years ago gave some advice to young law students, which was don't be known as what he called spring butts, which was making objections just because you can. He made the point that as a judge and as a juror too, sometimes if you're springing out of your seat making every possible objection, it can make it look like you're not confident in your case, pick and choose. Well, during argument as well, something to think about, is that constant objections, while they may interrupt the flow of the argument of the other side, may make you look like you're less than confident in your case. And as a bench officer, I will tell you that I and many of my colleagues, after the objections are made, look, if it's a legit objection, it'll be sustained, but many objections are simply overruled or sustained with an admonition to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just closing argument. So. Take it for what it's worth. If you're confident, save the objections and just wait until you have an opportunity, if you get an opportunity to speak, and just shake it off. One objection that's often made during closing argument, and here's a practice tip, objection misstates the evidence. Many judges, when they hear that one, are gonna overrule it, because here's the problem. What if the judge sustains the objection or overrules it, but the judge's recollection is wrong? The judge doesn't have a rolling transcript in most cases and doesn't have the opportunity. What the judge may simply say is, ladies and gentlemen, you know what the evidence was. You heard the testimony, and you'll decide this case based on what you determine the evidence to be. That's a dangerous objection for the court to sustain because if the court gets it wrong on appeal, it could provide grounds for reversal. The jury knows exactly what was said. Look, we're doing our best, we're taking notes, but we might have missed a question and an answer. So if you're certain about what was said, you know better than we do. We do our best, but sometimes we get it wrong. And with that, let me turn it over to Olivier. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank you all for inviting me here. I know that you were uh, expecting Ricardo Echeverria. Um, I'm a bit of a downgrade, but I, hopefully I'll, I'll provide some nuggets. Um, and it's, I, I was driving up, and it's an amazing campus, and I'm, and I'm kicking myself. I, I went to law school in Washington, D.C., and I checked the weather today, and it's like 35 degrees. So um, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit before I do the closing argument. And thank you, Molly, that was a, that was a great, 
Um, that was a great closing argument, and it really made me want to get a job at Green Borlet because th those are some great cases, um, and you did a fantastic job. So thank you for that presentation. I want to talk about a case uh, that I tried in December, so it's fairly fresh in my mind, and give you a sense of how I approach closing arguments uh, in, in a somewhat difficult case. And, and I'll give you sort of the basics of the case. I had a it's an admitted liability case, okay? Uh, my client was in a crosswalk, the defendant uh, ran him over. So admitted liability. I had waived all uh, economic damages because the medical bills were about $8,000. The injury was, was fairly significant, uh, but my client was 84 years old. And as a result of the crash, his quality of life really hadn't changed all that much. Uh, and he was very, very poor which is like a lot of my clients. And so as I'm going into this case, as I'm going into this closing arguments, I have some concerns, right? Is there, can anybody sort of you know, figure out you know, what some of those are? Um, anybody? No? All right. I don't have a bad guy. I, I, don't have, I don't have an antagonist. I don't have somebody who did something wrong. And the one emotion you want to draw on closing argument and I learned this from, from Jerry Spence, I, I, I studied at the Trial Lawyers College, is you want to draw righteous indignation. Not anger, righteous indignation. You want your jury to feel righteous indignation. And it's very hard to do when you don't have a bad guy. Okay? So I have to create a bad guy. I have to create a, a, a breach of trust somehow. That's number one. Number two, I have a client whose life hasn't changed very much, uh, and who's also very old. And, you know, when you're talking about non-economic damages, somebody who's very old, things like pain, suffering, emotional distress, uh, juries aren't very likely to give you a lot of money, especially since he was very poor. And so the thing that I want to avoid, and as I, I don't want jurors to think, well, you know, $100,000 is a lot of money for him and you know, grant $100,000 and then pat themselves on the back thinking they've done a good thing, right? So those, those are the things I have to address. Those are the things that I have to deal with in closing arguments and make arguments um, to defeat those. Now here is the strategy. What closing arguments should do is you're gonna have, every jury is gonna have you know, two, three jurors that are really for you, really on your side, Two or three jurors that are really not. Uh, and, and everybody else is kind of in the middle. And so what I'm trying to do in my closing argument is I want to give the jurors that are really good for me, I want to give them ammunition. I want to give them stuff that they can go back into the jury room and tell the other jurors, no, we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to, you know, we're not supposed to consider this. We're not supposed to consider that. I want to give them tools to tell the other jurors that they should do it the right way. And so with that in mind, I'm going to go over uh, a bit of the structure, and, and I'll, I'll go in and, out of, uh, in and out of role. I just wrote an article in The Advocate on closing arguments. If you're interested at all, just talk to me after uh, the presentation, and I can give you, I can send you a PDF, um, and it talks about some of this. So, all right. So here we are. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Oops. There we go. Um, you've heard all the evidence in this case. And in about an hour or so, you will retire to the jury room and you will essentially have two tasks. Now, the first task is going to be to select a four person. Now, the four person is the individual who's going to um, engage in the conversation and make sure that everybody has a voice. Now, some people, very easy to talk. Some people, it's a little harder. I want to encourage each and every one of you to let your thoughts and your feelings known to everyone. Tell everyone what you believe. Your voice is important. Every one of your voices is important. You know, we talk about an election, people vote in Los Angeles County, it's millions of people. One vote matters, but it has a diluted effect. When you're sitting in that jury room, that one vote is one of 12. It's probably one of the most influential votes you will ever have. So let your fellow jurors know what you think. Let your fellow jurors know how you feel. The second task that you're going to engage in in this jury room 
is to fill out the verdict form, and I've put it up on the screen. Now, in this case, there's no dispute. Uh, liability has already been established. It's on the defendant. You will have to decide damages, and there are different kinds of damages. Now, for each area of these damages, nine of you need to agree. Nine of you. As you move on to the next question, also nine of you need to agree. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be the same nine. Okay? As long as nine people agree on either of the questions, you've done your job. And the four person signs the verdict form, and you can tell everyone that you have a verdict. Now, in evaluating this case, in evaluating the evidence, you are guided by a jury instruction that talks about the burden of proof. More likely true than not, right? If this were the scales of justice, and they're even, if putting a feather on one side tips the scale ever so slightly, um, I've met my burden. That's what the burden of proof is in this case. So as you're evaluating the evidence, I want you to remember that. Now, one of the most important thing as you're evaluating this evidence is can you trust this evidence? Now, trust is the foundation of our justice system, right? Witnesses come up, they take an oath, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Trust is the foundation of a jury trial. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, long time ago, uh, said that half the truth is often a great lie. And we've heard a lot of that in this case. We've seen a lot of that in this case. We've seen the defense approach witnesses and show them only one part of a document, not the whole truth, or refer to one part of their deposition, not the whole truth. Remember that? And they've done this in an attempt to minimize the severity and the impact of the injuries to my client, because that's what they're here to do. Make no mistakes about it, ladies and gentlemen. The defense's job is to make sure that the number at the end of this trial is as little as possible. They don't care about my client's well-being. They don't care about his health. They don't care about his life, about his family, about the things that he can no longer do. They just don't want to pay. And in that effort, they've minimized every single thing in this case. Let me tell you what I mean. And this started with opening statement. During opening statements, we heard counsel say that the plaintiff stepped off the curb, Klein didn't see him, and despite just applying his brakes, was unable to stop before making contact. It just stepped off the curb. Now, we've seen evidence in this case that tells us exactly where this happened. And it didn't happen right as my client stepped off the curb. It happened in the middle of the street. And these are some of the photos that were taken off the body cams, where you see my client well into the second lane, almost immediately in the middle of the street. And from this angle, we can see how far he was thrown. His feet are about 10 feet away from the pedestrian walkway. This was the impact. They minimize. What else? On opening, you heard counsel talk about, oh, other than a bloody nose and abrasions to his knees, he only had right hip pain. Only right hip pain and bloody nose. Now, there's a term called gaslighting, okay? And it's a fancy way of saying it, but essentially gaslighting is, is when you tell somebody that something is false, when all the facts and all the evidence points to it being true. And the problem with gaslighting people is it actually makes them think that they're crazy because they're being told over and over and over and over and over again that something is false when in fact it is true. And as a result, it has become one of the scariest and most common form of mental manipulation. And ladies and gentlemen, make no mistakes about it. The defense in this case has been gaslighting you because the evidence that we've shown you do not match their arguments. Just a bloody nose. Well, let's see. Yeah. Señor, ¿dónde te duele? Aquí, así, nada. 
Ok, no te muevas, ok? ¿Tienes tu identificación? Sí. ¿A dónde está? Aquí está. Mira. Ok. Le, si le quería hablar a mi casa, yo aquí. Sí, a, a, no te preocupes de eso. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. ¿Tienes alguna condición médica? ¿Eh? ¿Tienes alguna condición médica? ¿Como qué? Como diabetes, problema sí. de corazón. No, no, diabetes. ¿Dónde te duele? Aquí, en el pecho. ¿El pecho? Eh, y las piernas. Dame, dame tu ay, identificación. Ay, ay, ay. ¿El carro te pegó y te miras acá? Sí. Just a bloody nose. Now, you've heard evidence about... How much time do I have? <laughs> uh, you've heard the evidence in this case, and it's largely undisputed. This is the list of injuries in this case. Uh, I can go ahead and, uh, at this point, and I'm going to step out of the role for a second. This is the part where I lay down the actual facts of the case. And I use exhibits. I use transcripts that I've gotten from the court reporter. We get uh, daily, so we have access to all the transcripts. I will pull quotes. I will make sure that they're highlighted. I try to be judicious when I do it. That's very good advice. Uh, to try to make some of the major points that need to be made to show that everything that I said on opening actually happened. Now, you heard about credibility. Credibility as a plaintiff's trial lawyer is literally the only currency we have. And when we walk into the courtroom as a plaintiff's lawyer, you're already in a debit. You, you walk in as a plaintiff's lawyer uh, missing credibility. And you have to gain that credibility throughout the trial. It starts with voir dire. Uh, it continues with opening. And hopefully, if you've presented the evidence that you said you were going to present, by the time you're in closing, uh, you have some of that credibility built up. But this is the part where you go over the evidence the fracture, the uh, rib fractures, the nose fracture, uh, talk about the consequences of the injury, the different conditions that he's had to live with as a result of that. Uh, explain, again, the surgery that was done to the spine on an emergency basis. Uh, this has all been discussed by the doctor in the case. So we go over that evidence, show what the x-rays look like after. So the point is you sort of give the jury a visual representation of what this gentleman has to live with. Then I brought evidence of his primary care physician. Now, uh, it is somewhat small type font. Uh, I, as you were giving your comment, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, uh, you know. <laughs> uh. um, but it, it is very much my outline, and so, I will address the jury, and, and, and they're a little closer, but I would say, you know, you heard about Dr. Gomez. Dr. Gomez was Mr. Kalkinis' primary care physician for 15 years. Uh, he's an independent witness, right? He has no stake in this case. He has no dog in this race. Um, he's not hired by us. He's not hired by the defense. He came here and he told you uh, what the facts were. He has a patient-doctor relationship with Mr. Kalkinis. All of his treatment is necessitated by what he believes are his needs, not motivated by anything else. Uh, he is literally the best witness that can tell you about both the past history and the current symptoms of Mr. Kalkanis. And the next one, just to tell you a little bit about the case, when he was on the stand, uh, I had him for about 45 minutes I drew about 60 objections from the defense. I mean, it was, it was insane. And, and so, on closing, again, very good comment uh, by Judge Leaf, is, is you want to point out these things, right? Especially if you think it's going to go in your favor. So, on closing, I say, you know, anyone who wants to know the whole truth, not the half truth, not the kind of the truth, but the whole truth, would want to listen to that doctor. Anyone who wants to know the truth in this case would want to let him speak. And what did we see? Um, now, next, the defense expert, uh, Dr. Caden, uh, also agrees that Dr. Gomez, the primary care physician, is in the best position uh, to opine. So now let me go ahead and talk about the impact of the injuries on Mr. Kalkinis, and what we did learn from Dr. Gomez. And again, uh, it's life-changing, 
use of transcripts with bullet points. Uh, he's now more fragile. He uh, thought that there was a 99% chance that he would die from his injuries. Uh, he never needed a cane before. Uh, he's now developed a heart condition as a result of these injuries. Um, that's never fun, constipation. And we also learned from Dr. Gomez that although Mr. Calcanis had some medical problems, uh, none of them were severe. We're talking mild to moderate type of issues, none of which would have shortened his life expectancy. And more importantly, uh, Dr. Gomez told us something that we all know to be true. Uh, if you want to stay, uh, if you want to stay alive, you got to stay active. And the injuries to Mr. Calcanis effectively prevent him from doing that. All right, so now let me talk about the things that the defense brought up that simply do not matter in this case. That's a red herring. <laughs> so you've heard from the defense every opportunity they could that Mr. Calcanus drinks a lot of alcohol. What relevance does this have? It's not going to shorten his life. Um, he drinks from time to time, and when he does, he drinks too much. That's true. We've acknowledged it. I didn't run away from it. It's who he is. Um, they talk about he's got stage one kidney disease. And you've heard from the doctors that stage one kidney disease, especially for an 84-year-old man, means absolutely nothing. Another thing they brought up, and they pointed him out on the photos, is he's got varicose veins in his legs. Again, what's the point? It's only to distract you from the truth. So now that we've heard the evidence from Dr. Gomez in this small type font again, apologize. <laughs> think about the defense opening statement, true or false. Did they tell you the truth? Uh, very minimal non-displaced rib fracture. Those did not require any treatment. That wasn't true. After this accident, his use of narcotics actually decreased. That wasn't true. The limitating pain before the accident, there's no evidence he was in any kind of pain before the accident. Problems walking before the accident, fabrication. Before the accident, he used Norco, which is a narcotic, and it was prescribed to use at least four times a day. We know that that was a half-truth. The back is now the strongest part of his body. Again, complete fabrication. And because of his arthritis and his weight, he would have had to use a walker regardless of whether the accident happened. Those were statements made by the defense in opening, trying to sway you, trying to use primacy to get you to look at the case through their lens. But as the evidence has shown, none of these are true. None of them. Consequences of injury. This is where I go over the medical treatment that he received. Uh, this is where I go uh, over the testimony of the defense doctor and explain why a paid defense expert uh, is not someone you should rely on. Uh, basic things, saw him once, uh, paid for the defense. And I made this point. You heard Dr. Caton, the defense expert, get on the stand, and I asked him about his clinical practice when he sees patients that he actually treats not the ones that he comes to testify against uh, in court of law. And I asked him, well, when you have these types of patients that have had these types of injuries, how long do you follow them up? And he said, indefinitely. Indefinitely. Why? Why do you think you have to follow a patient like that indefinitely? Because they continue to have problems. Because things flare up. Things happen. Complications. That's why you follow them indefinitely. Now, that's what he does in his clinical practice with the people with whom he has a patient-doctor relationship. But yet he comes here in this trial and tells you that Mr. Kalkinas shouldn't do that, doesn't deserve this kind of care, doesn't deserve to be made whole in the same way that his own patients are being made whole. Now, I don't think that's very reasonable. All right, we talked about 
uh, damages during opening. There are 10 categories of damages in this case, uh, nine that apply for the facts of this case. There are physical pain, mental suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, disfigurement, physical impairment, inconvenience, anxiety, humiliation, and emotional distress. I'll go through this quickly because you've heard it all, but this is the jury instruction for non-economic damages. There are no fixed standards, and it's based on the evidence, and there's a very important word in that sentence. And I, I, I'll, I'll point it out, because it's based on the evidence and your common sense. We rely on both. And part of the process that you will engage in is to appraise the value of the injury. What is it worth? So what is the reasonable value of the pain suffered when he was struck? What is the reasonable value of the pain suffered from a broken spine? What is the reasonable value of the pain suffered as a result of 14 fractured ribs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? In determining the proper amount of non-economic damages, just like anything else in this case, jury instruction 117 makes it very, very clear that you may not consider the wealth or poverty of any party. So what does that mean? When you're going back into the jury room and somebody says, well, that's a lot of money for Mr. Calcanus. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. Okay? That's considering the wealth of a party. Your job is to appraise the injury. Because here's the thing. Some things are relative. Sure. Loss of enjoyment of life. You have to look at the person's life before, the person's life after, and make a comparison. That's relative. Things like inconvenience. Again, it's relative. You look at the person's life before, how were they inconvenienced, and you can put a value of that. But things like pain, things like suffering, those are not relative. Those are the same whether you're rich, whether you're poor. And so whether you have Morgan Freeman, Jeff Bezos, Mr. Olmos, Clayton Eastwood, Alan Marin, or Mr. Calcanus, it's the same pain. They feel the same pain. They feel the same suffering. And whether they're making $20 million a year or whether they're making $20,000 a year, that number stays the same. So you're not to consider the wealth of any party in your deliberations. Another thing is the defense is going to try to tell you, well, you know, he had some medical conditions, he had some health issues. You should consider that. But again, jury instruction 3928 tells you that uh, you must decide the full amount of money that will reasonably and fairly compensate Mr. Calcanus for all damages caused by the wrongful conduct of the defendant, even if a normally healthy person might have suffered less. So the fact that he had a more fragile spine than a 20 year old doesn't matter. Doesn't matter and you're not to consider that. One of the arguments the defense is going to make is that because Mr. Calcanus is old and because Mr. Calcanus' life expectancy is shortened, that you should give him less money. And what I want you to consider when you're evaluating these arguments is when you have something precious, and I think we can all agree that life humans that our health is precious when you have something precious is it more valuable when it's new or is it more valuable when it's old I'm gonna go over my time a little bit not by much and I'll give you an example the McDonald uh, viola 45 million dollars very old I looked online to see what would be the most expensive violin I can buy today. And what I came up with was $25,000. And there's oodles and oodles of examples like that. Uh, Ming Dynasty vase, 
$22 million. Uh, most expensive vase I can buy today. Uh, let's see the search results. Most expensive new vase, $101,000. We value precious things that are old more, not less, more. That's why we call them the golden years. They're not the copper years or the tin years or even the silver years. They're the golden years. Those, those are the good days. You've worked all your life, spent all that time raising kids, family. Now you get to enjoy yourself. And Mr. Kalkinis has been robbed of that. This is what I believe uh, constitutes fair past non-economic damages in this case. Now, I want to talk about the loss of enjoyment of life for future damages. And, and I call it it's the concept of, of the two cookies. So there are these, um, these shortbread cookies that I really like. And I have four kids at home. And so I, I, you know, I buy these cookies and um, sometimes I'm on my way home and I'm thinking, I'm gonna have me a cup of coffee and two of these cookies, right? And I'll get home and I'll go into the cookie box and it's already open and one of my kids is taking two cookies. Okay, there's six more, it's okay. I'm not happy about it, but at least I eat my two cookies and I go on my way. Now, imagine the same thing, except that when I get home, there are no cookies. Scarcity. Scarcity is a concept that we recognize. The less of things there are, the more valuable they become. Right? Diamonds, gold, precious metals. The less of things there are, the more valuable we consider them. Mr. Calcanus only has six to seven years to live. They're not worth less. They're worth more. For the purpose of brevity, I will skip this slide, which is also very small. Talk about small pleasures. Uh, Mr. Calcanus uh, is not the kind of man that could go to a golf course. He's not the kind of man who could travel the world. He doesn't have the means for that. So you've not heard a lot of evidence about those types of things that he could do before, but he did have small pleasures. He did have small things that he did that made him feel good, that pleased him, that gave him joy, that added value to his life. And as a result of this injury, he can no longer do them. In closing, um, they've turned a productive, independent, helpful, hardworking, family-oriented man into someone who's useless, reliant, a burden, very sedentary, and dependent upon his family. Uh, putting some context at $2 million for future non-economic damages for the last seven years of his life comes to about $30 an hour. And, uh, oh, this is a good one. Um, I forgot that. Uh, they had a bunch of lawyers on the other side. Okay, it's rare, normally, it's, it, well, sometimes it happens. But, so I, I said, you know, the, the defense is gonna come up and they're gonna, they're gonna tell you a number, it's gonna be very low. But you know, the defense knows it's a big case. They know it's a big case. They had uh, three and four lawyers sitting at the table the entire time. Uh, they were throwing everything at the wall to see if it fits. Uh, they're representing half truth and trying to gaslight you uh, about the injuries and only reading parts of documents. So they know it's a big case. People vote with their feet. And this is one of the slides I, I love to end on, especially in an admitted liability case. The fans always try to make themselves look like they're doing the right thing, and we say, we're sorry. And I said, you know, a, a good apology has three parts. First one is, I'm sorry. It's also the easiest part. They're words. They don't really mean anything but it's important. The second part is, it's my fault. 
Now, I will give them that for whatever reason. Uh, they've done that. But the third part is, what can I do to make it right? As you deliberate this case, as you figure out the damages in this case, I'm asking you, don't let them forget the third part. Don't let them forget the third part. Thank you very much. Well, that was so good, I barely noticed all those small, small words on some of those slides. So, Olivier made a very good use of the video and the testimony in the dailies. Something that's very effective that always strikes me when I'm sitting up on the bench is when someone is able to incorporate video evidence, the uh, medical evidence, into the closing argument to remind the jurors of what they saw. When they're going to be back in the deliberations room, they'll have the exhibits to look at, but seeing it presented like that, it's compelling, and it highlights for them what they should be paying attention to. Also found the use of the celebrities uh, with his client in the six-pack. The mug shots was quite good. Rich or poor, famous or obscure, it's the same pain. Makes a very effective point in pictures. The value of old things via Google search. I've never seen that done before, and that was also very effective. It stood out. The concept of two cookies also I enjoyed. And the last slide was very effective. Any good apology has three parts and that people often forget the last one. Here's something that I've seen during a trial, and this was when I was a juror, and something that I think may not occur to you as advocates. What happens if you're too persuasive? Remember that if you're going for punitives, you know, you've already gotten damages and now you're going for punitives in that phase of the trial. Remember what happens about excessive damages where it's presumptively excessive and the judge quite likely will reduce it? Well, what happens if you're so persuasive that the jury awards more than 10 times damages? I've seen that happen. The jury was so persuaded by counsel that they took the number that counsel was asking for in punies and they exceeded it by about a factor of 10. Why not, since you know how much is too much, why not say, I'm asking you to give this amount, but you know what, if you don't think that's enough, if you think my client actually deserves more, why don't you go as high as X? But do me a favor, don't go a penny over that. Just shut them down. Maybe you reduce the risk after the trial of the judge reducing the award. But I've seen that happen. The attorney was so persuasive that the jury at the end of the trial said he's not asking for enough. And they went over the top and then the judge went and reduced it way down. So let's have another round of applause for the advocates. I want to thank you all for your attention, and I want to thank Pepperdine for inviting me to speak. It does my heart so much good to come back after all these years and to see all of you here working so hard to reflect well upon our noble profession. Actually, your noble profession. I forgot I'm not one of you anymore. I also want to give a quick shout out to Dean Phillips. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see you, sir. So I know we're a few minutes over and I want to wrap up our closing for this conference and just acknowledge to all of you again, my appreciation for all of your attendance, for our speakers, for our sponsors, for our vendors, for our attendees. You guys help make the advocacy programs here at Pepperdine as successful as they are. Your support of this conference, the support of our students, our alumni, and those individuals that continue to come back is something that's very important to this university and this law school. With that being said, I want to thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the panels. If you have any questions or anything else we can do for you while you're here, please reach out to me or Rebecca Malzahn. Otherwise, please enjoy your Saturday. Have a lovely day.